Hi, and welcome to the Passionistas Project Podcast, where we talk with women who are following their passions to inspire you to do the same. We're Amy and Nancy Harrington, and today we're talking with Laurie Lynn of Overall Buddies. Laurie is a national early childhood specialist, an international speaker, and an award-winning children's singer-songwriter. She's the creator of Overall Buddies, a series of original songs and videos for young children and the grown-ups who care for them and love them. Recently, she expanded her business to create her first children's book. So please welcome to the show, Lori Lynn. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. We're really excited to have you. What's the one thing you're most passionate about? I am most passionate about early childhood. So everything and anybody that has to do with early childhood, that's my number one passion. And that includes teachers, well, of course, young children, zero to five is my expertise. <laughs> so anything having to do with that, teachers and librarians and families and quality programs that serve early childhood children. And then second to that, and a very, very close second is my music. So right now in this last act of my life, as I've heard, you, heard, you hit a certain age, you're in your last act. It was my mother's last wish that I follow this dream finally, and I am using both of those passions, early childhood and music. How are you combining those two things? I combine those two things with the brand that I created. The business that I've created is Overall Buddies, and I create quality content um, for children and the people who love them, like you said. And that's the biggest part of my mission is that it's going to be quality content. And number one is the social emotional connection that music can have for young children and those around them, their families, their classmates, their teachers, um, just feeling connected through the music. So you mentioned your mom, so let's take a step back a little bit. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And when did you discover your love of music? I grew up in a small, small town in Iowa. I'm an Iowa farm girl, and it's called Primgar. It's the only Primgar in the world. <laughs> we had a big whopping number of 900 people in our town. <laughs> yes, I had like 30 people in my classroom, and we were one of the biggest classrooms. I knew I loved music from the earliest, earliest age. My first song I wrote was when I was five years old. And it was about my brother's motorcycle because <laughs> everybody was excited about this motorcycle. So I went around singing this song about how he loves his motorcycle. And um, it was kind of a cute little song. And it was about, I love my Yamaha. -ha. And now I live by Omaha. And so I'm writing a song about how I love my Omaha. -ha. And so it's the same tune since I was five years old. So <laughs> it's stuck in my head and so I've always written these really earwormy songs, you know, that, that my brothers will say, I remember that song and it sticks in my head, darn you, you know, those kind of things. So I always loved music. It was something that saved me. My um, father was, had real anger trouble and took it out on us sometimes. So it was somewhat of an abusive childhood. Um, it wasn't every day. It was very sporadic, but he died when I was 12. And my life after 12 was just blissful with my mom and those of us that were left. And, you know, my dad, though, loved music and music was always allowed in my house. And my mom was 16 when she got married. So she grew up really with all these children and she grew up. I mean, she was 16 and got married. It was like the late 50s. So she was in her early 20s when the Beatles came out and the Rolling Stones. And, you know, my brothers are 10 years older than me. So I grew up with tons of music in my house. And, you know, my mom was a young woman. And so she had all these albums and music. So my life was surrounded by music. And I always, um, it was always tugging at me. I, I would say to people like, I don't know what God wants me to do with this. It's either a curse or a blessing. I don't know, but these songs keep coming to me. And I'm like, okay, I'll write it down or I'll record it on a dictaphone is what I used to use. <laughs> you know, it was a cassette recorder and then I had a dictaphone and now I use my voice memo on my, on my phone. But it's like these songs will come to me and I'm like, it's either really a curse or they're, they're going to bless me or other people someday. I just kept answering to it and capturing them. So now I'm trying to figure out if it's supposed to be what I was supposed to do all along, right? Did you ever perform live? 
oh yeah, I sang at church from the time I was, I think second grade, I was singing in the little choir and singing solos and I loved singing in front of people <laughs> and I got a guitar at fifth grade and I was always singing at church and then I was singing in school and I was a music major, a voice major for two years and then at college. So yeah, I didn't know what to do with music. I just knew it was going to be in my life. I kind of struggled in college. Like, I don't think I want to be a music teacher and I didn't really know what else to do. So I just went to elementary education. I thought I can use music in my classroom all the time and which was true. And so that's kind of how that happened. So then tell us about that progression. You studied education, you got your master's, and then you started teaching. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'm glad you asked because it's really a funny story, actually, that I became a teacher because when I was little and people asked you that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I had no idea, but I would say, this is my standard answer when I was little. I don't know what I want to be, but I know I'm not going to be a teacher. That's what I said to everybody. Not going to be a teacher. That's all I know. And why did I say that? Because I was one of those little children who had what they would probably call ADD right now. I was busy. I was antsy. My brain was always working. And, you know, I told you I came from somewhat of an abusive childhood, so I kind of needed attention. And I wasn't mean to kids, but I was an annoyance to my teachers, I'm sure of it. And I could feel it from them right? And I learned at a very young age, school was very easy for me. And if I got a paper and I got done quickly, I got more work to do. So I learned to not finish that last question <laughs> and just, but my brain was going, going, going. And I would think things like, can I throw this big eraser out that window? How, how high of a velocity do I have to get it? Because the window opens this way. I was always thinking, right? And so I knew that it wasn't fun for teachers to teach. <laughs> I could feel it. But the transition happened when I knew I didn't want to probably finish my music degree and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went home and I taught Bible school at church. And there was this fifth grade boy who was really antsy and just kind of difficult. And I just knew what he needed. He needed something hands on. He needed all those things we know now. And I just got it. And this um, person at my church said, you really have a gift for this, Lori Lynn. You need to be a teacher. So I went back and that's what I did. And I always say that teaching found me. I did not pursue it because that was the last thing I was going to do. But it has been the biggest blessing for me. And I do think that those of us who struggle in school, especially young ages, probably make some of the better teachers because we get it, right? And we kind of know what they need. Yeah. Was music always a part of your teaching process? Oh yeah, always, always, always. It was because I didn't know it then, but early on I just knew that music connected us and music made the atmosphere an atmosphere of collective consciousness almost, right? I didn't know those words my first years of teaching, but I just knew it changed the atmosphere when I utilized music to transition or I use utilize music to teach something right because the power of music we know most, so much now and I love to train on this because I train teachers as well what music does to our brain and how it lights up our brain and gets us so ready to learn so it's so powerful and so yeah I always used it just natural instincts and also it was a great place to try out my songs that I had written like let's just have some fun singing and just bond right and so I always knew what songs really worked and they would give me ideas sometimes of songs and so yeah it's always been a part of who I am and where I go. <laughs> are your songs always geared towards children? They are now they weren't as I grew up when I was growing up I just kind of you know you start realizing you know about three or four chords you can write some songs and I wrote the most horrific, awful song in seventh grade about Mary and Louie were happy and free. Something bad happened and it broke them up, you see. I mean, it was just horrific, right? 
they end up, you know, it's a Romeo and Juliet thing where they end up killing themselves. It's awful. And, but so no, I, I mean, you experiment, you know, I was like sixth grade or seventh grade and my mom even said, well, that's an interesting song. <laughs> but I also wrote a song that's about, I can't do nothing. And it, it's on my CD. It ended up sticking. It was just kind of a silly little song about how you go about your day and everything bad goes wrong. And that one was something that we put on the CD. My producer really liked and he goes, put that on there. It's fun. So it's, uh, yeah, it's always been part of it. And then I went through a country Western stage and most of those songs will never see the light of day or no one will ever hear. <laughs> but, but there's a couple that have some, have some, some legs, I think. And I would like to show them to somebody someday. I don't have a voice for that. But that was kind of a long stage, actually, that I wrote a lot of country Western songs. I like to tell stories and songs. But it was when I had my own children. That's when my pastor had the best saying, and I wrote it down, and I've never forgotten it. He said, when you find your purpose in life, it is the most peaceful place to live. That's where you live is in your purpose. It's not just be. It's not just find. You live in it, Right. And when I started writing songs for my boys, the lullabies and the fun songs, I'm like, this is what all this has been for. And I knew that it was something for my boys and I, but there was always something pulling at me. Like, that's not it. There's more. You're supposed to be sharing this with other children. And I always wanted to, I just never had the money, right, to do it or the, the know-how to know where to go and how to start. And um I just got started really seriously recording it like about eight years ago and I was going very slowly, <laughs> saving money and going into the studio and my mom would hear every story and she just, I'd get done at the studio and she goes, come and tell me what happened and do you have anything recorded and can I hear your bits and how far are you and she just, she listened to all my dreams. She was a quiet, quiet lady and I am not. <laughs> and so I have moments I love to be quiet too. But when I talk about my passion, I can talk a mile a minute and, and go on forever, right? I think a lot of us that have passions and dreams, it's, it's uh, you can talk somebody's ears off unless they stop you. <laughs> and that was my mom. <laughs> Tell us about her. What was her background? She, like I said, they... Um, got married young, um, 16, 17, that right around there. And she was a housewife. We were um, farmers and farm wives work hard. Um, especially my dad was an only child. So there were no brothers around to help with the farm work. Um, and so mom, we had, she had eight children. <laughs> so she did all the house stuff, the cooking and worked in the field. And never did I hear her complain ever. She just did it. You know, that's just, she always says, this is what I do. You just get up and you do. And so it was the true, true farm model, really, right? You just pull up your bootstraps and you do. Um, you know, you have a storm and things are, you know, falling apart. You just go figure it out and fix it, right? So you kind of get that growing up on a farm, I think. How did her life change after your father passed? There were four of us left at home and she was only 39 because my dad died at 49. He was 10 years older. And so I think of that now and I think, wow, uh, how did she, she, she had finished her GED a couple of years before my dad died. He kind of knew it was his third heart attack. So he said, you need to finish your GED. So you have more options if I go. And um, she started working at the school, which I loved. She was a cook at the school. And so I got to see her every lunchtime. And she'd always give me extra vegetables, you know. She'd go, you need a little more of those. <laughs> it was so funny. And so I always like seeing her. But it didn't pay enough. So she had to change jobs. After a couple of years, she, that was something nice for her to do to keep close to us. And um, then she started working in a factory about 30 miles away. So she was gone every morning about six. And so my older sister had graduated. So it was kind of just me and my little brothers. And I wrote 
you know, if they were sick, I wrote the notes for them and I was just kind of got them up in the morning and fed them breakfast. And, you know, it was just, I always, it was just the three of us. It was kind of nice. And mom got home, you know, and she worked at the factory for a long, long time, like most of her life. And she really kind of liked it. She, she was the type, she was so laid back and she was happy to go and do the same thing every day and just kind of have her friends. And she just did not complain. What do you think you learned about women's roles in society from her? I think I've learned things that I mimic from her. And I've also learned things about boundaries and standing up for, for things. Like I remember when I was little, I didn't say it so nicely. I said, I am not going to be a pushover, you know, <laughs> cause I saw her that way. But as you grow and you learn about what women's choices were back then, what they were dealt and how they dealt with that, what kind of supports were available for a woman that had eight children and no high school education. Her husband was not particularly kind to the children, but if she had left or done something else, would it be worse? I mean, I think it was, she kept the peace more than I realized, you know, and stepped in when she had to step in. But it was, it, it's been a process for me too, to try to, to come to terms with my sadness for her life, my, my pride for her life, my love of what she sacrificed for us, you know? Um, so it's a very different choice. We're very different choices. And, but I've learned that no matter when you're born or what era you live, women have those choices and they can make that choice to stay or they can make that choice to live. Now, if, it, if you're in an abusive situation, please, go, please get help and I hope you go, right? Um, because now we have much more support for that. So I think I've learned a lot and, and we got really close her last few years. She came down to live by me because she was very sick and I had four, five years with her down here and saw her every single day and it was pretty amazing. We're Amy and Nancy Harrington and you're listening to the Passionistas Project podcast and our interview with Lori Lynn of Overall Buddies. To learn more about her original songs and videos for young children and the grown-ups who care for and love them, visit overallbuddies.com. If you're enjoying this interview and would like to help us to continue creating inspiring content, please consider becoming a patron by visiting thepassionistasproject.com backslash podcast and clicking on the patron button. Even $1 a month can help us continue our mission of inspiring women to follow their passions. Now, here's more of our interview with Laurie Lynn. So tell us more about Overall Buddies. How can people see the content and hear the music? Well, I knew, I, I thought, okay, I want to make a CD, but I thought, I'm kind of a Miss A plus person. Like, I'm like, if you, you know, I'm like, I want to know, how do I make this more than just a CD? What are people doing? So just like you, we met through a class, right? So I signed up for an independent musician class with Rick Barker. And, you know, I just learned about the business side of it and how musicians nowadays, we have to have, they say, seven different ways to make money because basically our music's free, right? So I thought, okay, how can I do this? So I thought, let's create a brand and make some videos and have some storylines maybe going and that's coming and maybe get a book um, series going. So I had this big picture in mind. And so I just started with the little steps, but I think I'm the type of person, not everybody has to be this way. I have to know what the big picture is. So it looked like I was stalled, but I knew that in my brain, I had to know where am I going with this? So I knew what steps to take. And I knew I needed to come up with a name and I was trying to find a name that nobody had on the internet. So I had other names that I tried and I'm like, darn, somebody's got the .com and I wanted the .com, right? You want to own that SEO. And so I, I just knew overalls have a meaning for me because my dad, you know, we grew up on the farm and there was a time like in the spring and fall, there were these big jobs to do in, in the farms and the neighbors would help each other. Like whether you were baling hay, for instance, that's a big job and you need other hands. So, or shelling corn, that kind of stuff. Well, the neighbors would show up and help. And I'd see these big neighbor guys in their overalls come and they were ready to work, right? It's like overalls meant friendship and we're here to work and cooperate and get things done. So I just, overall, it's kind of silly that I have this 
such a deep meaning for overalls, but it was just such a visual for me as a little girl to see these neighbors coming together. And, and then my dad and my brothers would have their turn to help the neighbors and put on your overalls and go help your neighbors, you know? So I loved the whole idea of overalls and I was doing overall friends and I was doing, trying different things and buddies came up and I'm like, oh gosh, that's fun to say. And there was nobody that I owned everything. There was nothing. Nobody had .com, .net, .org and I bought them all, right? So, and it's cheap if nobody has them, it doesn't cost much to get them. And so now if people just search overall buddies, you're going to come up with my stuff. And that's really nice to have, right? So I'm really fortunate that I found that name and saved it early. I, I saved that name probably eight years ago when I first started. I'm like, I'm going to save all that, even though I don't know what I'm going to really get to using it. Um, Cause I've had a couple different ideas stolen because I wasn't careful. So I thought this time I'm going to be really careful. And so that's kind of how that name came about and um, the overall buddies. And I love the whole double meaning of overall after all and overall we're all overall buddies, right? So I'm kind of excited about that name. It's been catchy and it's been happy and I'm happy about that. So I had three missions really when I started overall buddies um, because you got to really figure out what is your why? What is your purpose? And so my why was, why do you want to do this? I read this book by Wayne Dyer, Wishes Fulfilled. If you have not read that book, anybody that's listening, it's so marvelous, especially if you're going to be an entrepreneur, which is, you know, and encourage people. It's, he quotes all kinds of religions and, and he talks about the collective consciousness and, and just connecting to that energy and things, but I'm a Christian. And so he also uses that. And so I think we're all connected, no matter all of those things. And so he said, you have to know your why. And I've heard this more and more now, but that was the first time I'd really heard it. And I read this book probably seven years ago and I still go back to it because I'm like, what is my why? And it's really pretty easy when I get caught up in, can I make money at this? Oh my goodness. Was I crazy to quit my job early and take less, you know, and like, I just have to go back to why are you doing this? And it's those days, like my lullabies, when I sat with my children on those wee hours of the morning and there's no light except that little night light and you're feeding your child and you make up this lullaby and you sing to them, right? And there's, it's like nothing else exists and it's so marvelous. And I just, that is my why for my lullabies is I want, when I picture mothers singing that to their children or a friend of mine sent me a picture of her three-year-old daughter singing one of my lullabies to their new baby. And I just started crying. I'm like, if I never make a cent, that is so worth my time, <laughs> you know, to know that she's sharing that love like that. And then my funny songs, the same thing when I would write, I'm a pig, for instance, um, which seems to be a, a favorite and that's the book I'm going to be making. My boys would help me with ideas because the pig goes, shows up at this little girl's in her town at different places. And we lived in a small town at that time. And they're like, mom, the pig needs to show up at the library and the pig needs to show up here. And, and I said, well, the song can't be an hour long, but these are great ideas. <laughs> Let's choose four, <laughs> four places, you know? And so, but we would sing it with the, you know how you sing in the van with the windows down and then their friends get in the van and you're like, you want to sing my mom's song? And we would laugh. And so when I can picture like moms doing that and our families doing that, well, I don't care if they know it's me. I don't care. I said, one of my visions, I told my boys, I said, someday I think it'd be so cool if I was at an airport somewhere in a different state or different country and I hear somebody singing my song and they have no idea it's me that wrote it. You know what I mean? Just saying, oh, my song's in the world and it's making somebody happy, you know, <laughs> right? So when I get lost in all the other stuff, I'm like, okay, you're leaving something behind and that's good. How old are your sons now? They're 30 and 31. I have a grandson now. He's 16 months old and it's amazing. And he's helped me write. Well, his daycare closed during COVID. And so I said, you know what? I lost all my gigs. I was just starting to get up and go, right? Because my first CD just came out in 2019, in the spring. And I was doing some free stuff, getting myself known. And then I was just starting to get really nice paid gigs and had like 30 things lined up for the summer of 2020. Womp. <laughs> like, well, darn. Hopefully that comes back. It's not coming back yet. 
for children's stuff people are still tentative but i have a few libraries and schools lined up but it'll come back and i'll do other things right that's why we're supposed to have other other branches on our business tree is what i call it but yeah so he's been here since june every day and now he's we're starting part-time but we've written like six songs together with him sitting out in the front room and and he just loves hearing me play guitar and and every now and again, he'll hit the guitar and point to the stand like, I'm done. <laughs> I put it back now. <laughs> like, I'm okay, you're done. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, we've written some songs together. So it's kind of fun to kind of Like what? Them. Well, we wrote a fishing song and we wrote a bath time song because his, his mom said, I need a song for bath time. And it goes, it's my bath time, ba 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 bath time, skiddy da da ba dee bop bath time whoa bath time ba, 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 bath time so it's just kind of cute and it talks about you know getting in the bath and i'm thinking what would help a parent you know i need it to be long enough like okay we gotta take our shirt off and but also being careful about don't make it so somebody can use it the wrong way right you know because you got to be aware of these things so i said you're just gonna step in then you got to wash your face wash your hair and so it just kind of goes through that and it's pretty cute. I haven't recorded it yet. It's just, I've got about six songs that we've written and one's a dance song that I think is going to be really fun, but I need to just, uh, all the income stopped. <laughs> so I'm like, well, we got kind of back at that. Okay. Let's get some things going where I can get back in the studio. Right. So, yeah. You know, I was talking about my mission statements, and one of them is to create quality content for young children and the people who love them to help them connect to those people around them. And so, and to help parents, like songs can help, right? And so there's all these different things that I think about my songs, like this one's going to maybe be a helpful song. And at the beginning, it goes, bath time, like you're calling them in, right? A blah, 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 bath time. So it's kind of like, hey. Because that's the, um, what do they call that? That's the universal, do, 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 is a universal through the world is those, that interval. So I use that bath time. It's a universal interval. I don't know if you knew that, but now, now you know. what. You mentioned your upcoming book. Tell us a little bit more about it. The book is I'm a Pig. It's my song put into a book. And if you're familiar with Rafi or Lori Berkner, some of the, the gurus of children singing, they have books based on their songs as well. And the reason that is really important is that music and literacy connection, right? If a child knows a poem like Itsy Bitsy Spider, right? And then there's a book, there's so many books made on Itsy Bitsy Spider. And there's a reason because when children are so familiar with the words, they're going to be really feel like they're confident in looking at the book and going, oh, I already know what that book's supposed to say, right? So they start thinking, oh, these words are what I've been saying. And so that connection is stronger. And so it's not just, hey, I want to make a book on my song. There's real research behind why to do it. And so I've always wanted to make a book out of that song plus other ones. And then I have a series of my puppets and and characters I want to make eventually. But I thought, let's start with this one because teachers and librarians have been asking, they're like, that'd make a great song. And the other thing about this book is there's some really great extension activities with it and there's story elements that you can teach children with it. And I, I want to be able to teach that to families and parents. Like, you know, there's settings because they go to different places. So you can start using those story element vocabulary with children but it's in a fun way. So it's going to be, and I'm going to make the words very interesting on the page. So that's another um, strategy to motivate children to look at print and be excited about talking about the print. So there's a lot of really purposeful, intentional teaching things that go in it, but it's going to be really fun. Did you do the illustrations? I cannot draw at all. I have... <laughs> If you have backed my Kickstarter, I put something on there about this is why I have an illustrator because I kind of mocked up the, the, um, the title page and I just have no sense. I don't of like the legs are just like, they don't even connect. I don't know. I have no sense of space 
of how to draw. So no, I've hired an illustrator and that's one of my other mission statements is to um, utilize local artists in the Omaha Council Bluffs, Iowa is where I live and it's right across the river from Omaha. So to utilize the Omaha metro area artists as much as I can and um, pay them fairly. That's so um, my mom's last wish for me was to use anything she left for me to do this CD. And that's how I was able to get it done quicker than I would have. So I paid people fairly, even children. And so the money went faster, but I feel good about that because I did the right thing. I, I think too often artists are, oh, you'll get exposure. And no, I, it's such a cute story. I have to tell you, there was this little boy who came and sang at the studio and we were in Christmas Carol together. So I've done theater um, quite a bit. I do a lot of theater and we were both in Christmas Carol at the Omaha community playhouse. And I used, there were like 24 children or something. I can't remember 18 children. And I asked them all to come to the studio and my producer's like, Oh, Lori Lynn. I said, they won't all be able to come, but I can't just choose some. I just can't. I said, we'll do them. In, it's my money. We'll do them in sections. We'll just brew six at a time. And it's, you know, and it, 12 could come. So we did six and six. But anyway, he came and did that. And then I paid him just, a, it was 30 minutes and they were done, you know, so I gave him a little bit and he came to the, my dress dressing room the next night and he knocks on the door and he goes, Lori Lynn, I need to talk to you about something. I said, what is it? And he said he had the money in his hand and it was so cute. He grabbed my hands and he said, I need you to take this back because I was so honored to get to sing on your CD. It meant so much to me and I really don't need you to pay me. And I thought about this and I said this quick little prayer and I'm like, I want to say the right thing. Do I take it and honor what he's asking or do I, do I tell him what I'm really thinking? So I said, okay, I'm going to say something to you. I said, listen, you have a gift you have a talent and that talent is worth something. And there's going to be so many times in your life that people are going to take advantage of that and, and want you to do it for just experience. And I said, I want you to take this and remember that you are worth this. And so he said, okay. And then he kind of got a tear in his eye and I'm like, I got a tear in my eye. I'm like, I need it, you know? And so I think it was the right thing. I really debated like, gosh, you know, but I wanted him to hear that, you know, cause we're in a small, it's a, it almost has a big city, but it's a small city and there's not a lot of work paid work for artists as much as there probably should be. Right. I mean, we just need to get that pendulum swung the other way that we need to pay people what they're worth. Right. What's been the most rewarding part of your career? Mm, seeing the things I've envisioned for so long actually happen. <laughs> like my mom, when I talked about Precious Baby, the first lullaby I wrote for my first child, and I told, she goes, are you going to put Precious Baby on your CD? And I said, mom, I just don't know if I can, because what I hear in Precious Baby is at least a string quartet. It just, I hear it, I hear it. And the video I want to make with it has a ballerina and she's orchestrating this rest time and the orchestra's there. And then she goes and orchestrates the rest time. I just envision it and that's going to take money. I said, I think I need to make my first CD and then make some money. And then, you know, that'll be later. So my mom was never the kind, she was this tough farm wife and she, she did not give advice. It just wasn't what she did. Right. It's like, you got it. You're capable. Right. So when she did this, it was not typical. And it was the day before she lost the ability to speak when she was dying. And she grabbed my hand. I was going to go. And I said, I'll be back tomorrow, mom. And she grabbed my hand. And it was so weak, right? And she looked me in, her eye, in my eye and she said, you take the money that you're getting from me and you finish those songs and that video the way you want it to be. And I just kind of went, okay, mom. And she just kept holding my hand until I looked her dead in the eye, right? And I said, I promise. And she just relaxed. And she lost her ability to speak the next day. So I'm telling you that day that we recorded that video, because I had the money to do it, I flew up above. When the ballerina started dancing, my body rose above everybody. I can't even explain it. I was above everybody watching it and it was like my mom was saying look you did it and it was just the most rewarding wonderful thing and I just can't even 
I couldn't believe that that was happening. And then I'm like, oh, geez, I got to pretend to sing now. I better get back down to earth, you know, and sit, stand in my spot. And it's funny because when I went and saw Elton John's movie and his vision, he wanted to go to the Hollywood Bowl. And when he got there, he rose above. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is a thing. This happens to people when they see their dreams manifested, right? And so I kind of feeling the same way about the book. Like when I first saw the cover, it was like I wasn't in my body. <laughs> and so I think that is just the best answer to that question because whether anything comes from this, I hope to make a living off of it. But to know that some of these things that were given to me from God, the songs themselves and this vision that I was able to just leave it on the earth is pretty amazing, I guess. Thanks for listening to our interview with Laurie Lynn of Overall Buddies. To learn more about her original songs and videos for young children and the grown-ups who care for and love them, visit overallbuddies.com. Please visit thepassionistasproject.com to learn more about our podcast and subscription box filled with products made by women-owned businesses and female artisans to inspire you to follow your passions. Get a free mystery box with a one-year subscription using the code Fall Mystery. And be sure to subscribe to the Passionistas Project podcast so you don't miss any of our upcoming inspiring guests. Until next time, stay well and stay passionate.